To you be the praise, Jesus. To you be the glory and the honor and the power and the dominion forever and ever. Wow. Ah, turn to your friend and say, Jesus is incredible. And you can find your seats. Wow. Ah. Shake out up. Much, much more. Shika Bongo. Ah. Wow. Oh. wow, praise God. What a what a wonderful, incredible time of worship that was, wasn't it? Wow. Oh, wow, I just felt like we got a, we just enjoyed heaven on earth right there. Uh, well, we want, to, uh, we want to bless all the students that were at our Catch the Fire schools this week. Uh, just before the conference started, we had, uh, we had a kingdom, Catch the Fire Kingdom Living School, and we also had a Catch the Fire RTF uh, issue-focused training school. Uh, hosted by Chester and Betsy, and uh, we just, I mean, we just had an incredible three days. So I'd like to invite all of, the, all of the graduates from both of those schools, please, to come on up here to the front. Clay, if I could just ask you to sort of z you get, put that wonderful, awesome 4x4 four four into reverse there so we can clear up this whole area here. That would be great. Ah! Wonderful. Come on up, guys. Shake our baba. And uh, um, I think it would be really good if we could also have the teachers that were on that school. So uh, Chester and Betsy, if you could come on up, please. And also John and Carol. Frank Meadows. David Odessa. Robin Tull. Travis and Anne Thigpin and Marguerite Evans, myself and Gordon Robertson. So if, uh, if we could have the speakers up, that would be great too, because you're going to help us pray for everybody. But uh, I think it would be really good, first of all, to have some um, testimonies. So uh, where's Lisa Millsper? Lisa, come on up here to the front, up here. Step right up here to the platform. And uh, also, Andres Falco. Where are you, Andres? Uh, Andres is an is a Argentinian, uh, Shika Baba, Moroccan missionary. He's a missionary to Morocco. His parents uh, moved there when he was nine years old. But anyway, so Lisa, uh, you, guys, you guys are on the Kingdom Living School. Why don't you uh, just share uh, your testimony for a moment or two? Okay. You're going to hold it? Yeah. I'll okay. Um, well, it was awesome. And I'll tell you what God did. He, as much as we might want to get rid of our junk, and sometimes we have hurts, no matter how many times we forgive people, God wants to heal that even more than we do. And I can tell you, there's a place for counseling and things like that, but then there is a time for a God moment. Mm. And, and um, Frank Meadows did abs the first part of the school on Sunday, and he, I don't even know what that class was called, but anyway, it was Healing Life's Hurts, okay? 
And um, he had us, you know, if you were willing, God would take you to a place that was a hurt. And there was, I've had hurt between my father and I. My parents were divorced. I lived with my father from the time I was 14. And I mean, I have forgiven him and forgiven him. And I honestly do believe that I have forgiven him. I know I've forgiven him, but that didn't take away hurts of certain moments. And God took me to a place, long story short, you don't need to know the place, but he took me to a place when I was 15. And I'm 55 now, so that's been a little while ago, and it still hurt any time that thing came up. And in an instant of time, you know, being coached through what we were learning, I went to that place. You, God stirs up all the stuff, all the hurts, but then in one instant, whoa! He takes every bit of the hurt away. He takes every bit of the pain away, and then without even asking, it was my father and I in the kitchen in a small apartment, and the very next minute, there was another chair, and Jesus was in that chair. And I can think about that moment anytime, and it is okay. There is no pain, no hurt, no anything. And then it happened again to another thing when I was eight years, same thing. I can think about it. Oh, it is healed. I mean, it's absolutely okay. Yes, evidently so. <laughs> That's awesome, Lisa. Fantastic. But move over this way just a little. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm shaking. I don't know if I'm nervous or it's the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, well let's be positive and say it's the Holy Spirit. How about that? Okay. <laughs> well, um, these three, weeks, three days have been for me a blessing. I'm very thankful to the Holy Spirit. I'm very thankful for everybody, every speaker. And I, I am learning to get used to supernatural power of God. We, we believe it, but we don't live it. So we have to, to leave it. And uh, I'm full from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you know that Morocco is going to be totally transformed forever? Shika <laughs> Baba. Wow, wow, wow. You know what, Andres? The Muslims will, may never be convinced by sound evangelical doctrine and arguments, but I tell you what, signs, wonders, and miracles and the supernatural love of God knocks them off of their feet in a second. <laughs> Fill them up, Heavenly Daddy. Fill them up with your glory. You know, he can speak French, Spanish, Arabic, Bring him back up a minute, Sean. We need to hear him speak Arabic. Come on, we need, we need to have some Arabic, don't we? Go, Sheikh oh. Ababa. <laughs> Stop if you want to speak. Give somebody a message on the internet that might be perhaps watching, that, that might be from an Islamic persuasion that needs to know their daddy's love. Just say something to them in Arabic. Oh. Assalamu alaikum, every, uh, everybody. Assalamu alaikum, kulkum li katshufu fina, wa shukran ala tfarjo fina. Kant lab, rab ghadi i bark fikum, wa ruh kudus ikun fikum. The name of Jesus, amen. Ah! Fill him up, Heavenly Daddy. Double portion. There we go. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'd also like to invite Deborah Bloodworth up and Bob Fox from the, uh, so that was the, that was the Kingdom Living School. Let's hear from the RTF School. Deborah, come on up right here, look. Stand just, stand just here. Right here was great. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Go ahead. Step up one more step so they can really see you. Oh, Betsy, look what you've done to her. Well, that's fantastic, Debbie. Let's give Deborah a hand. That was a great testimony. Thank you so much.
How many of you agree with Deborah? Yeah, see? We all agree. Where two or three agree, it shall be done. Whoa. Uh, oh, oh, mm, oh, 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 um, I went to the art. Oh. Okay, you've got about 30 seconds left now. Uh, um, Betsy and Chester. <clears throat> Oh, it gave us a, um, <clears throat> the tools <clears throat> to take back the ground that the enemy has stolen from us. Oh, and just in the first session, there were four. <clears throat> in the first session, I had total breakthrough. Whoa. Oh. And I jumped right through all three steps at once. <laughs> Whoa! Oh! You're okay. Hi. Hi, Bob. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm a pastor. Been pastor for a long time. And uh, I've also been a person who's gone through years and years of emotional healing and, um, to get over a, a traumatic childhood. So I'm no stranger to uh, the whole inner healing ministry or healing of the soul and spirit, as some people might call it. So I, I just took the training, and uh, I'd like to speak especially to pastors tonight, uh, both here and on the web, that if you're looking for a model to uh, train your people in, that is probably the most holistic, well-rounded model for emotional, spiritual healing. For something that's e the most easily transferable model, then I would highly recommend that you take a look at uh, Restoring the Foundations. Um, wow. it, um, it's got all the right pieces. It's got a great training model. Uh, Chester and Betsy are really uh, geared up for training people on how to do this. Uh, and, and training lots of people, lots of average Christians to do this so you don't have to oh great I'm looking forward to going then yeah you don't have to uh, you don't have to go to seminary you don't have to be a counselor but you can do this and there's a huge need I've done counseling okay so Bob just two seconds yeah, what happened yeah. to you what actually happened to you what actually happened to me was that uh, in the middle of the training God touched my heart it went back to an old memory and uh, I've had a sweeter and more uh, open relationship with the with the fathers wow. in the, uh, since then just uh, and, and I've been through lots of this stuff, and yet, you know, there are layers and layers, and God still went down there and touched it, even in the training session. Mm. So uh, in the actual sessions, I'm sure it would be even more. Mm. Thanks. Awesome. Ah, fill Bob, Holy Spirit. Fill him up. Thank you, Daddy. Wow. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Wow. Oh, let's give the Lord a hand for all this amazing work that he's done in the lives of all of these people. And uh, I'm quite sure that if we were to have a chance to interview each one each one would have an amazing story nod if that's true okay that's just a few of you nodding but anyway okay well listen why don't i'd like to invite the speakers up and uh and yeah just come on up and ben and sarah you come on up as well kate and ryan if you want to help anybody who wants to folks that are there on the front yeah we need some catchers so if i could have a few people run out real quick some, some guys come on up. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much. And if I could have you guys that are on the schools, just to listen to me for a second, I'd like you to line up shoulder to shoulder, stretching all the way that way. There's plenty of room, okay, in one single file row, okay, just one single file row. So if you guys could stretch out, that would be great. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate you helping me organize them there. That's great. That's awesome. Okay, folks, the rest of you, just stretch out your hands and let's just... I ask that God will really tremendously bless these guys. And, uh, okay. Oh, all right. Father, fill them up right now. Fill Barney. Fill Margaret. Shabba. Fill Victor. Fill them up. Fill Angela. Fill her up. Fill them up. Each one of them. Fill Tom. Shabba. Fill Harry. Holy 
Holy Spirit. <laughs> fill Kathy. Wow, wow, wow. Fill her up. Yeah. Fill, fill, fill yeah. Tammy. Fill Roxy. Fill her up. Fire. Fill Wayne. <laughs> Fire on them, Holy Spirit. Fire on Dennis. Fire on Lucille. Fire on Karen. Abba. Oh, fill D Diane. Fill her up. Fill them up, God. Fill each one of them. Fill Tanya. Fill Marlene. Fill Bill. Bill. Fill Bill. Fill Marianne. Fill Diane. Fill, 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 fill. Fill her up, Heavenly Daddy. Shika Bungu. Fill Connie. Fill Connie. Fill Susan Walsh. Shika Baba. Fill Randy. Fill her up. Fill her up. Fill, full, full, fill Linda. Fill. Fill. Abba. Fill Beth. Abba. Fill Ken, Holy Spirit. Shake up Baba. Abba. Fill him up. Fill Carol. How many of you would like to have gone on a school, catch a fire school like that? Great. Well, a few of you, a few of you out there. Well, the good news is that we're coming to do an International Leaders School of Ministry right here in Virginia Beach. Thursday, March the 25th until Saturday the 22nd, 27th. So that's March 25th, Thursday, to Saturday, March 27th. And the speakers are going to be myself and Kate, Marguerite Evans, and Gordon Robertson. And uh, worship uh, with Rob and Kelly Oji. So it's going to be a fantastic time. We have brochures. Uh, we want to give them out right now. Okay, if you're interested in coming on to the International Leaders School with us, raise your hand up like this, and we're going to give out some brochures as fast as possible. Marguerite's going to give them out. Wonderful. This school will absolutely revolutionize your life. We've done them all over the world, and uh, everywhere we've gone, pastors and leaders have had their lives completely transformed. When we went to do the very first one that we ever did, one week leader school in Kyrgyzstan, you probably never even heard of Kyrgyzstan, and for good reason, it's a very, very long way from here, and it's a Muslim country in the former Soviet Union. And after we did the school, we had 300 pastors and leaders on the school, and two months afterwards, they gave a report to us saying that their churches had more than doubled in size despite the fact that it was a staunchly Muslim country because daddy's love is irresistible. Ah. Yeah. Yep. Kate just mentioned to me, we're actually going to Peru so you can pray for us. We're going to do a leader school of ministry in, in Peru in May with Victor Marcos. He's, he's down there somewhere, but uh, we're going with him. He's organizing the school. And it's going to be incredible. It's going to be a ton of leaders, uh, pastors that are going to be coming to that school in Peru. And Peru's never going to be the same again. I can't wait to go. Um, uh, just while we're talking about schools, we have... Uh, a number of uh, schools now around the world, Catch the Fire schools, which is very, very exciting. Um, I don't know if you remember, but uh, this time two years ago, Kate and I uh, announced that John and Carol were sending Kate and I down to Raleigh, North Carolina, to plant uh, Catch the Fire Raleigh. Uh, and I'm ever so pleased to tell you that we did actually do that six months later and we launched the church on September the 21st and by the grace of God we're going strong and we're preparing for the the next great awakening that's what I believe that we're here in the United States for the, nothing short of the next great awakening along with many many other ministries of course that are going to be part of that and our church is just going fantastically we have an, a new center that we've moved into and uh it, uh, it seats about, it will seat a capacity of about 350 people, um, and 
We're already filling it up. We have anywhere between 200 and 250 adults every Sunday now, which is really, really exciting. And so the Holy Spirit's just, just moving powerfully among us, and the, the church is really uh, just, there's just such a love and a sweet presence of God. And uh, that's what we're most excited about, is the presence of God with us. But uh, we also launched last September our School of Revival. And uh, we, it's a two-year school of ministry um, that we are training and equipping people to be phenomenally successful in the kingdom. And, uh, and so it's a school where there's room to be able to get a job uh, part-time to help with the fees, etc. And uh, it's just been such a rip-roaring success this year. And the students are also going to be going off to Peru with us. And we try to have one international uh, trip per year. And, uh, but really, it's a school for training and equipping people to be incredible church planters and incredible ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter what their walk is, whether they're taking one of the, seven mountain, one of the six other mountains or whether their calling is to take the church mountain, whatever it might be, we're just wanting to equip everybody to be an incredible success in, out there in the world, bringing the kingdom of God wherever they go. And uh, so if you're interested in coming to our School of Revival, uh, you can apply uh, online at ctfraleigh.com. Um, but we also, as a ministry, have launched over the past year schools now all over the world. We have one school of uh, Catch the Fire school in uh, London. We have a Catch the Fire school in uh, Norway. Uh, and we have, uh, sorry, not London, in England, in Manchester, I'm sorry, in England, in Manchester, England, we have a Catch the Fire school in Norway. We have a Catch the Fire school in Brazil, and we have a Catch the Fire school in Cape Town, South Africa. And all that's happened in the last year. It's just been fantastic how God's just exploded it. And uh, you were really, really going for training and equipping people for revival and for the next great awakening all over the world. So it's very, very exciting. Praise God. And so we've actually formed what we're calling the Catch the Fire College so that it doesn't matter which Catch the Fire school you go to, whether it's our school of ministry in Toronto, which has been going for the last 15 years since revival broke out, uh, or whether it's the school of revival, Catch the Fire school of revival in Raleigh, or in Manchester, or in Cape Town, uh, you're all part of the Catch the Fire College, which is really awesome, the global college. So that's good, isn't it? Yay! So Jesus, we give you all the glory. We're very, very excited, and... Uh, Shaba, right. You gotta just love chaos, haven't you? I just, it's awesome. Mm. Holy Spirit, don't ever let us go back to the dull and boring church that we used to be. You know. I can remember the, when, the day when you went to church and you never expected God to show up. In fact, it looked more like a, a funeral parlor than a wedding feast. Remember that? Do you guys remember that? That was. This wasn't good, was it? All right. Um, I just want to talk about a few resources that we have. How many of you really, really have enjoyed the Stallings and the band for the worship? Oh, hasn't it been fantastic? They have been fantabuloso. They have just brought out Hot Off The Press today, I believe. Is that right? Today. Tonight, this, their album is just cut tonight, Shabbat, and it's available for you at the Resource Center, and being the amazing, generous three that they are, they couldn't give one away because there's three of them. In fact, really, there's four of them now, now that, you know, Wade's come along. In fact, there's five of them. There's six. I mean, goodness. Anyway, you're multiplying. Shika Baba. Right. They would like to give these three away. So, um, Ken, I'm going to give you the job of giving them away. And that, in, that means all three of them, Ken. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, while we're... How many of you really have loved Bethel worship? Yeah, isn't it fantastic? Well, Brian Johnson, uh, Bill and Benny's son, Brian, has, has done a, another fantastic CD and DVD uh, called Love Came Down. It's a live acoustic worship in the studio, but it is fantastic. Anybody who's ever had the, the joy and the privilege of hearing Brian Johnson, um, you know, th hey, these aren't to give away these ones. I, I can't give his, his away. But you can, you can get it. <laughs> Why are you all hating me? I just gave three away. Gosh. I know, I'm, I know you do, I know you do. Okay, so Brian Johnson, fantastic. Make sure you don't leave without that. Also, Kim Walker, fantastic. Uh, she's a family, she's a favorite in our family. Kim Walker's done an awesome CD. Here's my song. That's available too on the resource table. Is that, is that Mr. Fox, Pastor Fox? That's Pastor Fox. <laughs> you got to love it, haven't you, when the distinguished gentleman is absolutely undone and discombobulated in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I love it. All right, Heidi and, uh, and Roland have written a fantastic book, The Hungry Always Get Fed, A Year of Miracles. And these guys are, without doubt, in my mind, the most extraordinary missionaries that I've ever heard of. And I come from a missionary family. 20 years, my parents were missionaries in Africa. And uh, these guys are absolutely, yeah, they're absolutely so amazing. In fact, my brother Murray's here tonight. He's pastoring with us in Raleigh. And uh, so Murray Smith's right there. So it's great having you, Murray. And Murray's wife, Ash, did the, uh, did the RTF school, so that's really exciting. The Hungry Always Get Fed, this book will change your life, revolutionize you, and wreck you in a good way, and turn you into a fantastic missionary. That's my hope for you. All right, good. Okay, well, we're going we're gonna to take our offering tonight, and uh, tomorrow night we've got a special uh, missions offering, but tonight... Uh, we're going to take our offering, which we do at, the, at our conferences, and uh, what a joy it is to give. I'd like you to turn, please, to the book of Luke, chapter 21. Luke, chapter 21. And we're just going to read the first four verses. So Jesus is in, the, is in the temple. The context is that he's in the temple, and it's just in his last week he's about to go to the cross. He's about to die. He's about to give his life. It says here, as he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. In Greek, two laptas, which were absolutely, virtually worthless coins. They were, it's like putting in uh, two one cents pieces. So he also saw a poor widow put in two very small one cent pieces, coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave, out, gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. You know, I've always thought this story is a remarkable story, but the Lord began to show me one or two things just recently in this story, that are really extraordinary. And one of the things that, that just blows me away about this story is that, in fact, it was John that pointed this out to me. You know, she gave two coins. If she'd given one coin, 
she would have given away half of her entire wealth. How many of you know that if you gave away half of your entire wealth, that would be a very extravagant blessing tonight? An extravagant gift. In fact, I, I really doubt, and I don't mean this in any critical way, but I, I really doubt that there's any of us in this room that would be prepared to give in a regular offering half of our entire wealth away. And the Bible tells us, not quite so clearly in Luke's version that we've just read, but in Matthew and in Mark, it's a little bit clearer. It actually says that Jesus went up and stood near the box and just watched them putting their gifts in. I mean, you know, that's a little bit awkward, don't you think? It'd be a bit like me tonight following the tray around. Right. Oh, really? That's it, eh? Okay. All right. That's not bad. Hey, that's not, that's, that, that, we could improve there a little bit, but that's okay. Yeah, that's not bad. Wow, wow. And just walking along, watching the plate go by, how many of you would feel like, wow, that Duncan Smith, man, he's just the worst robbing pastor that I've ever met or ever done an offering talk. You would feel like that, wouldn't you? You'd be, you'd be outraged. You'd be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe he did that. Jesus just stood there and watched them putting the offering in. And didn't deter any of them because they were coming in and loading their bags out, you know. <laughs> Looking at Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah, not bad, hey. Next one comes up, same again, same again. Finally, this lady comes up. And she stands there and she, she just drops, ding, ding, and that's it. And you know, Jesus, the astonishing thing to me is that Jesus watched her put both of them in. He didn't stop her and say, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. Hey, hey, lady, 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 one's really extravagant. Stop right there, okay? We know, listen, between you and I, we, we know. Yeah, we know. And he could have given her one of those looks as if to say, I know that you are being extravagant by just putting one in. But no, he doesn't. He stands there with the same look, perhaps, and watches her put not just half of her wealth in, but her entire wealth and livelihood into the offering. And he doesn't stop her. You know why he doesn't stop her? Because he knows and understands that there's something better in this world than money. It's called Heavenly Daddy. He's called Heavenly Father. And he knows that as she puts in her entire wealth into that offering, she is putting her life into God's hands. And she, he knows that God's hands are a whole lot better and safer hands to fall into than any investment that this world has to offer for you. That's why he didn't stop her. Because it was kinder to allow her to put the entire wealth in than it would have been to have stopped her halfway. So that's the first thing, and John pointed that out to me. The second thing the Holy Spirit pointed out to me, uh, you know, directly, and that was this, that it occurred to me one day, you know how we often hear, uh, you know what, be careful what soil you sow your seed into because you want to make sure that you get a good harvest. So make sure that you sow your seed into good soil. And, you know, the inference often is, and by the way, this ministry is really good soil. <laughs> so just sow right here with us, you know. And whilst that's true, I believe that's true, that catch the fire and spread the fire. Uh, our ministries are very, very good soil. I absolutely believe that. But look at what Jesus, right here, this lady is sowing her entire wealth into soil that is not particularly good. In fact, she's putting, he is letting her put those coins into one of the most corrupt religious systems on planet earth at that time. And he doesn't stop her. He doesn't say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. It would be much better if you would just keep that. And instead of putting it in that bad soil, why don't you just bring it over here? Judas, come on over here, bud. And Judas comes over with the, bas with the real offering basket that's really good soil, Jesus' ministry, and says, here, sow so, so those two little coins into this 
soil right here. It's way better than this corrupt system. You know, the Holy Spirit showed me, actually, it's not the earthly soil that you sow your seed into that matters. Whatever seed you sow in the kingdom, in faith, you're sowing it into an altogether more fertile soil in the kingdom of heaven. And it doesn't matter where you sow it in the natural. You could sow it into what, something that you or I might consider to be the worst soil imaginable. But God is not looking just at, he's not looking at where you sow it particularly. He's looking at the heart of the sower who's sowing it. And what he's looking for is a, is a heart whose fertile soil is of the same fertility as the fertile soil of heaven in his heart. And so tonight, as you give your offering tonight, I want you to understand, you're not sowing in to spread the fire. You're not sowing in to catch the fire. You're sowing into none other than Jesus Christ himself. You're sowing into God the Father. You're sowing into the glorious kingdom of heaven. And God is no man's debtor. And he will cause your seed to reproduce not just the seed you've sown, but up to a hundred and even into a thousand times what you've sown tonight. So if you were just thinking tonight, for example, of putting an offering in of five dollars, if you sow five dollars into the kingdom of heaven, let's start again. If you sow five dollars today, you take it down to the bank, you say, I'd like to put it into the safest deposit possible, they're going to give you a return of about one and a half percent on your investment per annum. That means that you are going to have five dollars and five cent this time next year. Or you could take your five dollars and you could sow it tonight into the kingdom of heaven and Jesus promises you a return 30, 60, 100, and even up to a thousand fold, I've read it. So that means that if you sow five dollars tonight, God will make sure that up to five thousand dollars comes back into your bank account. Now get up, turn around to your friend and say, I get upset with long offering talks. <laughs> Come on, that's the economy of the kingdom. So if five makes five thousand, fifty makes if you sow fifty dollars tonight the holy spirit says five fifty thousand is possible to come back to you in your lifetime that's a pretty good investment honey where's our checkbook let's just get ready <laughs> well, that right. okay let's get ready ushers if you could come forward let's pray as we uh, you write make your checks out to spread the fire and you could, make, you could also take an envelope, please, an envelope. And you can fill that out. If you want to make a credit card payment, you could fill that out. Make sure your details are filled out correctly. If you're writing a check, there's no need to write out the details because we have them on the check. But uh, those of you that want to make a, make a check out, make the check payable, please, please, to spread the fire. Spread the fire. Okay, let's pray. Uh, for those of you that are able, just take up your offering like this. Take your seed in your hand. I want you to imagine right now that you're walking up towards Jesus and you're going to put that seed right in that box with him. Give him a good smile. Look up into his face and say, Jesus, this is what I want to give to you tonight. And I'm trusting you for a 30, 60, 100, and even up to a thousand fold return. So... Father, we thank you so much for the joy of giving, for getting to be like you. It's one of the most amazing ways that we can see you, the invisible God, appearing to us in amazing, phenomenal, tangible ways when we get the kickback, the return that comes back to us. And so we're excited tonight. We're cheerful and we're happy about giving. It's our joy to give, Jesus, to you. And we sow our seeds in faith tonight, believing that the soil of the kingdom of heaven is so fertile that we're going to reap back an incredible thousand-fold return on these seeds tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right.
All right, if I could have the team help me. Okay, so you. Other way around. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you guys on the platform, just come around the back. Thank you. You can eat your hot dog while you're doing this talk. Okay, well, it's uh, it's with uh, tremendous pleasure and joy to welcome our guest speaker tonight, uh, Ryan Wyatt from Abiding in Glory Ministries. And wow, he preached an incredible message this morning. How many of you really appreciated this morning's message? Wasn't that absolutely amazing? And, uh, and we're just so ever so thrilled to have you, Ryan. Why don't we all stand up and let's welcome Ryan Wyatt. All right. Boy, it's been a rowdy crowd here this morning and tonight. <clears throat> we had a good time this morning. The Holy Spirit's been invading morning meetings lately. So that's been fun. But I want to welcome all those that are watching uh, by webcast. And uh, I hear you're watching from around the world. We're already getting your prayer requests in. And... Uh, we're going to pray for the sick tonight. How many of you here tonight, you're believing God for a miracle of some kind, and you need healing of some kind? And Well, that's a lower number than usual. Normally, it's like 85% of the church needs healing. But we're going to go after it tonight. If you need healing in your body, you need a miracle, we're going to go after that. We've been seeing some amazing things as um, I've been traveling around the world, and, and uh, we've been seeing, I was sharing this morning, we had a a woman that lost 65 pounds instantly. As, uh, now, I can't turn that one on and off, but I'm just trying to, you know, at least I can lift your faith, you know. <laughs> but uh, just amazing miracles uh, in the glory. And I want to encourage you tonight that um, you don't have to wait until the end of the meeting when I begin to pray for people or the ministry team prays. We really begin to go after it. You don't have to wait for it because right there where you're sitting, uh, just listening to the message, how many of you know the kingdom of heaven is at hand right now? The kingdom of heaven is at hand, which means that all those things that are impossible in the natural realm are possible for you right here in this room. Amen? And um, we've just been having incredible things happen. I remember... Not too long ago, we had a man sitting in the back row. Those of you sitting in the back row, you're, you're a target too. But we had a man sitting there, and um, we were taking some testimonies. I was up taking some testimonies. A lady had just come off of her oxygen tank, and, and uh, tumors were disappearing. And um, <clears throat> I was just taking the testimonies of people that the Lord had already healed. And here's this guy sitting back on the back row with a paralyzed leg. He had not been healed yet. And um, suddenly, I hear this lady begin to scream. She just begins shouting at the top of her lungs. And so I stop the meeting and look back there. You know, everybody's looking back there. And here, here she comes, walking up with her husband. And we couldn't tell there was anything wrong with him. And he gets up there, looks perfectly whole, and tells me that 34 years ago, the doctors snipped, uh, they did a surgery on his back. And they accidentally snipped the nerve to his right leg. And they completely paralyzed his right leg on accident. So it was immediately paralyzed. And over time, you know, it's now 34 years later up to the night he was sitting in my meeting. And uh, his leg had turned into what you'd call like, like a twig leg. Uh, all the, the muscle had disappeared. And uh, it, it was just literally inches around. It was like bone and skin. And uh, no feeling whatsoever, cold to the touch. And as I was taking the testimony of the people who were already healed, and I want to encourage you tonight, you've got to begin to contend and press in for your miracle. I'm going to be talking about how to birth the impossible tonight. And uh, it may be a miracle you need. It may be a dream that God's given you. It may be a prophetic word. Whatever it is, we're going to talk about how to birth the impossible, how to birth the supernatural things of the kingdom tonight. And I encourage you to contend. And this guy was back there contending. And uh, he felt something touch him. It felt like a hand, he said. And uh, 
his wife looked over and saw it and began to scream because she saw brand new muscle literally exploding in his leg. Right there in front of her eyes, his eyes, he's watching his, his leg literally grew out on the spot right there to the size of his good leg. Feeling came back for the first time in 34 years and he came up and I mean it took us a while to even believe the guy because he walked up looking completely whole. And um, we're just believing for those miracles to happen tonight. How many of you are expecting, the, I mean, kind of, you ought to expect for the kingdom to come with power. And um, we're going to be praying for some of those by webcast as well. We've got those that are already emailing in. And, um, you know, have got right here a two-and-a-half-year-old boy with de- developmental problems. Uh, he's had open-heart surgery. Um, man, look at this. I mean, on and on and on. So we're going to go after these um, here at the end of the meeting. How's that? You guys can join with me in releasing uh, healing over the airwaves. But uh, for those that are new to my ministry, I just want to mention real quick, my name's Ryan Wyatt with Abiding Glory Ministries. I didn't do this this morning, but uh, for those of you that are new to us, you say, who is this guy? What's going on? Um, I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, our ministry is Abiding Glory Ministries. I'm married, my wife Kelly, uh, and I have three boys, uh, Anson, Valen, and Davin. They're just young boys, six, four, and two. And uh, they keep us busy, very busy. And um, we, we uh, for several years now, I've been traveling the nations. My primary call is to equip the saints for the work of ministry and to raise up an army that is living authentic, supernatural Christianity and expanding the kingdom. And that, to me, in its most simplest form, is two things. Number one, it's a people who are head over heels in love with God. They're head over heels in love with God. They're not just worshiping the plastic Jesus, the religious Jesus. They've met the real living Jesus, and they've been wrecked. They've been messed up, and uh, they're living for him. And number two, those people that are living out of that secret place, because that's the primary thing. You know, I'm, I'm equipping people to live the bridal paradigm, that priestly calling, that vertical relationship with God. And out of that, they begin to live the kingly anointing, and that is every day bringing the realm of heaven to earth and destroying the works of the devil in your sphere of influence, being an ambassador for the kingdom. And so I love to demonstrate the kingdom. I love to move in revival and things like that. But uh, I love also to see you equipped. And uh, so we're going to be talking about some of that tonight. But I want to share a praise report and uh, just make an announcement for those of you that want to tune in. How many here just... Uh, in, just curious, how many of you have God TV? Anybody have God TV here? They're growing network, many of you. But we've been working really hard for two years, well, no, three years now, in uh, building our content and things like that. We just launched on God TV um, in February, the beginning of February, Wednesday mornings at uh, 9.30 Eastern Time, right, prime time morning, right before Joyce Meyer. And uh, it's a foot in the door. We're, we're going from there. And uh, we just got news we're going from reaching 18 million potential people in the U.S. to, as of April 1st, we're going worldwide with our show and reaching a potential 500 million. From 18 million to 500 million. So, and that's all God. And let's give the Lord praise for that. We're <clears throat> I want you to just... Uh, be in prayer for us because we're in a, a moment right now where the, the wind is at our back and there's a message that really that, that I have to carry, our ministry has to carry and, and uh, we're in, in works with uh, publishers right now and books and things and it's time to get the message out there. And so that's just a praise report and also to encourage you to pray for me. Let me give some stuff away and we'll get into the message here tonight. Um, this one here is called Spiritual Atmospheres and Climates. Accessing and maintaining your open heaven. How many of you have heard all the songs and all the preaching and over the last few years about the open heaven? But you need to understand that to be theologically accurate and correct, the heavens have been open since Jesus rose from the dead, haven't they? The heavens didn't close. But let me, let me share with you what is going on. When the new and living way, Jesus, his his flesh was torn, he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, he opened up the heavens once and for all for us. And uh, when I talk about open heavens, I'm talking about the kind of lifestyle where Jacob was in the wilderness and he saw the heavens opened and he saw angels of God ascending and descending. I'm talking about the same supernatural kind of lifestyle that Jesus lived. That's available for us. But the reality is, is that the devil likes to release oppressive atmospheres over you personally, 
He likes to relieve oppress, uh, release oppressive atmospheres over your church, over your family, over your city, over your state, over your country. He is doing everything he can to prevent you from stepping into the fullness of the inheritance of the open heavens that Jesus has left for us. So when we talk about opening up the heavens, our job is to break through the oppression that the enemy tries to release so that we can step under and live under the heavens that are already open for us. And that's true Bible teaching on the open heavens. So in this set, I talk about how do you shift the atmosphere around you? As believers, we're not called to be a thermometer. Maybe you've heard this before, but like a thermometer that lines up with the temperature of everything else around us. But we're called to be a thermostat that sets the temperature and sets climate and sets atmosphere and establishes an open heaven over your life where you can then release it to other people. You know, when you have a sustained weather system for a, a certain period of time, eventually it becomes a climate. It becomes a climate. And the reality is, is that many, many believers although the price has been paid for them to live under an open heaven, they have allowed a hard, oppressive climate to develop in their life. And that's some of the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight, about birthing the impossible. And so in, in, in this series, I'll talk about how to change the atmosphere around you and literally begin to release the kingdom from you to re when other people are in your presence, they begin to step under the open heaven. Amen? So, Sean, will you help me in, in uh, giving these out? <laughs> that way, Sean is the bad guy if you don't get something. Now, uh, here's hosting the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be um, heading to Morningstar, Rick Joyner's conference tomorrow, and they're doing a Holy Spirit conference, and this is what I'm going to be teaching on, but I'm also going to be sharing some of it tonight as well, kind of tag teaming between the two that I just talked about, but... When you're born again, there is an anointing, the presence of God, the Christ in you, the hope of glory, that comes to dwell within you that never leaves. But just because the Holy Spirit is within you, that's not the same as having a manifest presence of God that rests upon you. There's a difference. And the Holy, there are things that you can do to host the Holy Spirit. There are things that you can do to create your life in such a way or to... to establish your life in such a way that you become a landing strip for the Holy Spirit to rest on. Another way I like to say it is, if one day you had a dove that came and landed on your shoulder, and this dove was the most precious thing to ever touch your life, and it changed you forever, and you never wanted that dove to leave. Now again, I'm not talking about the inside presence, but I'm talking about the establishment of the resting of God upon your life. You never wanted that to leave. You would begin to live your life to host and cater to that dove. In other words, if you're walking through your life and you begin to realize that, oh, that dove is starting to lift, then you would begin to come back into alignment and ask yourself, what is it that that dove likes? And what is it that that dove doesn't like? And the Bible goes into this a lot about not grieving the Holy Spirit. If there's any word that comes out of your mouth, let it be seasoned with grace, and it might give grace to those who hear. And so I talk about in here how to literally host the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And you know what? I promised this to somebody. You're in green. I don't know where she is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Come on. She grabbed me. She, she arrested me at the product table and... Claimed it early, so I, I promise this to you, hosting the Holy Spirit. There you go. And um, <laughs> one last one, uh, I'll let you hear a little bit of this one. This is called the overshadowing, and uh, you know, it seems like everybody and their dog's doing a soaking seating. And uh, I, <laughs> so I, I thought, Lord, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do a soaking CD, but the Lord said, I want you to do one, Ryan, and I... Um, I teach a lot on how to enter into the manifest presence of God. But many people just need, as they're getting started out, they need a tool, they need something that will release the manifest presence of God for them. That will create the atmosphere for you. And so I went into the studio and uh, went up to Cincinnati, John Belt. Anybody ever heard of his soaking CDs? And I said, John, just begin to play. And uh, when we feel the glory of God, I'll tell you, just hit record. 
And everything was spontaneous. I had some scriptures in mind, but that was about it. And uh, so some of these tracks on here are 25 minutes long, 17 minutes long. And there was such a tangible presence that was released that I actually at different times started to have encounters. And that was kind of the whole point of it all. Was the Lord wanted me to model how I use the scripture, the written word, as a doorway to enter into an experience with the living word. And so I model on the CD how I'm meditating on scripture and I begin to enter into the realm of encounter. And what happens is you enter into the realm of encounter on the CD as well. We've had people that were scheduled for surgeries to get tumors removed, bone spurs removed, um, problems hearing, all sorts of things. And they put this on in their home and overnight and all that. Woke up in the morning, tumors gone, just healings and testimonies from all over the world. And uh, Duncan, do you have this? Let me give this to you. I'll bless you with that, but I'll let you, um, yeah, I'll let you hear, I'll let you hear a little bit of it. Just go ahead and the sound guy, just go ahead and play that if you would. Then the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Lord, I ask for that right now, that the Holy Spirit would come upon me, that the power, the power of the highest would overshadow me. And Lord, the chromosomes of heaven, the very DNA of heaven was imparted to Mary's womb and created the Christ child, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Lord, I ask for that impartation of heaven right now, that I would be a partaker, a partaker of your divine nature. I feel it even right now, your divine nature. You're overshadowing. You fill me. You saturate me. You overshadow me. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Overshadow me. I want to partake. I want to partake. I want a taste of you, Lord. In this place of your glory. Lord, you say in your word in Isaiah 51, and I have put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, you are mine. Lord, plant the heavens. Plant the heavens right now, Lord. Cover me with the shadow of your hand. Cover me the shadow of your hand. Plant the heavens, Lord. With you, Lord, I am safe. With you, Lord, I have peace. I rest in you. I rest in you, Lord. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. You are my God. In you I will trust. Surely you will deliver me, Lord, from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. You will cover me with your feathers. Lord, cover me. Cover me with the shadow of your wings. Cover me. 
in this place. No arrow can touch me. No pestilence, no disease. It cannot touch me. You are my refuge. You are my fortress. You cover me with your feathers. You give your angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways. Lord, release your angels. Release your angels to me in this overshadowing. Oh, release your angels. There it is. The atmosphere of heaven. I ascend. I lift. I go higher. You carry me upon your wings, O oh God. Holy Spirit, we thank you. We thank you for your overshadowing presence tonight. We thank you for I soar with you, your Lord. manifest presence that's right here in this room tonight. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for visitations of your glory. We know that you're here already, but we say, Holy Spirit, keep coming. Let it be on earth as it is in heaven tonight in this room. Holy Spirit, give us revelation, not just of your glory, but of your ways. Give us revelation. Moses asked not just to see your glory, but he said, show me, God, show me your ways. Teach me your ways. And so out of your glory presence tonight, God, we ask you to let revelation flow about the ways of your glory, about the ways of your kingdom, and how to birth the impossible dimension. The things that are impossible in the natural are possible in the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I want to start by sharing a, a quick testimony. <clears throat> in the late 90s, um, I had already been in ministry and uh, had been traveling and things like that, but God was really beginning to teach me about the glory. And um, I remember at that time, I was down in Pensacola and had been going I had been at the Re Browns Brownsville Revival a good bit. And I remember watching people that were being touched by God, and here I am being touched as well. You know, you're familiar with Toronto, Brownsville, different ones, six million people, you know, coming down there. But I saw that people were getting touched in the glory of God, and then now years later looking at some of them, a good number of them, who took for granted that they could walk into a building and God was there waiting for them with manifest glory. But then after they left that city and went to other places, what I realized happened with many is that they became good at drinking from a well that other people had, had paid a price for and had learned to steward, but they never learned to become a well themselves. And so when they left the well that was of the, of the, the resident glory of God that was there, as soon as they got out of the revival bubble... They suddenly couldn't find God anymore, and they became disillusioned. And, uh, you know, at one time, they were the ones that were the most on fire. You thought they were, to, they were going to go the farthest. They were going to do the most for the kingdom. And then just a year or two later, they're disillusioned, and, you know, they don't know what's going on. And I began to see some of that, and I said, God, I'd want to not just be someone who, who drinks. And I love to drink. And, uh, you know, there was a time in my life where anywhere the Holy Spirit was poured out, I was there. I mean, I would go. I'm not one of these people that says, well, if God wants to touch me, he can just come where I am. No. If I even smell that the Holy Spirit's moving somewhere more than he's moving with me, I want to be there. I want to be in the thick of it. And so there's, a, there's a, a principle about drinking from other people's wells and other revival hotspots and things like that. But how many of you know God wants you to not just drink from other wells, he wants you to become a well. 
He wants you to become a drink. He wants you to become a walking revival. And so I began to cry out for God, even in the midst of revival, I began to cry out saying, God, I want my own personal revival. I want my own personal visitation of your glory that will absolutely ruin me forever. Now, I didn't understand what I was asking for. Because at the time, I had a bit of a fear of man issue. I had a bit, a bit of a, I, I say a bit, and I'm, I'm being kind to myself, but I had a dignity issue. You know, I was, I was always concerned about what other people would think about me. And uh, anytime I was in a meeting, I, was, I, was, I found myself, without even realizing it, I was acting, I was living my life according to what other people would think. All the time. And so many people do that. And one of the first things that God will do when he begins to visit you with his glory is he will destroy your dignity. He will destroy your dignity. David was a man whose heart was after God and uh, people didn't appreciate it sometimes when he was undignified and stripped down to his linen ephod, you know, which was like his underwear, dancing before the Lord with blood all over the place and, you know, and sacrifices and David just didn't care. He was going after God. And, uh, but at the time, I'm crying out for God, not knowing what he was about to do to me. And so I'm sitting in an upscale restaurant, pretty upscale restaurant. And um, I remember, I'll never forget the moment when out of the corner of my eye, I saw a mist. Literally, tangibly, the person I was there with, uh, with at the restaurant saw it as well. A tangible mist in the air start to come from across the restaurant I don't know what other people saw, but it, this was the natural. This was not spirit sight, anything like that. And came and settled down right over my head. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm having a visitation of, of the glory cloud of God. And I remember thinking, God, I'm, I, I, I so want this, but please not here. I said, God, please, please just wait till I get home. And literally, as I am thinking that and, and kind of expressing it to the person there that's with me, my speech begins to be slurred, my eyes get heavy, I can't lift my fork anymore. It's literally like the weighty glory that is like so heavy that the priest could not stand to minister. You, you know that, that, that scripture in the Bible, that there was a glory that came that was so heavy, so weighty, that the priest could not stand to minister. And I remember I said to the person, I said, get me out of here. Get the bill, get me out of here quick while I can walk. Because it was just going, it was going downhill the way I wanted it to go, but, you know, not here. And uh, for two and a half months, this cloud would come to me every day. Two and a half months, but he'd only come to me in public. That's how it started out at first. Honest before God, you can ask other people that knew me at the time, they would see it come in, the cloud would come in and come right to me and just envelop me. And it got to the point where I wouldn't go anywhere but like Burger King. I wouldn't go to any real nice restaurant, I'd be like, if I want to be carried out of anywhere, it's going to be something like Burger King. But they would carry me out and they would take me into my apartment and lay me down and I'd come to hours later. But I remember, I mean, just talking about it, you begin to feel the presence of that come back. But I remember I'd wake up in the morning, and it was just this season of visitation. And I'd wake up in the morning, and I'd just say, Jesus. And he would come. And I would just be out. And what would feel like 10 minutes to me was three hours, four hours, five hours. And uh, it just, it went by just like that. It's like, it's like God just took me right out of the realm of time where time was meaningless. And I began to have um, profound encounters with God. I didn't have language for it. I didn't have anybody that had taught me anything about it. I then afterwards got into the word, began to study those that experienced it. I didn't, but I had no grid for this. I mean, I would walk into, in the middle of revival where the presence of God was already very strong. I would walk in and just, and just walk through a crowd of people and it, like, it would look be like the Red Sea. They just hit the deck. There was this tangible glory that was there. And the Lord began to speak to me about how 
This was something that one day was going to abide and literally rest upon his people all the time. I remember James, uh, James Maloney telling me one time years ago he was ministering in Texas. And the Lord spoke to him and he said, James, for seven days I'm going to come with my glory cloud. And it's going to be a foretaste of what will one day remain all the time. And so James is ministering. And oh, the other thing the Lord told him is, um, in my glory cloud... For seven days, when my cloud is there, he said, nothing will be impossible. Nothing will be impossible. No sickness, no disease, nothing will be impossible if they come and they get in that presence. So he's there ministering, and this purple cloud moves into the room. And it would come during the time of the meeting every day for seven days. People coming out of wheelchairs. I mean, all you had to do was just move someone into the cloud, and they'd be healed. People were literally you know, praying for their sons and their daughters that were bound up, you know, maybe they were, they were going toward, towards the direction of the occult to the New Age or Satanism or, or just, you know, real worldly and away from God. And they were begging them to come to the meeting and they'd say, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not going to that meeting. There was one couple that literally, while their teenage son was sleeping, they went in, got on top of him, hogtied him, literally hogtied him, put him in the car, brought him to the meeting... Had some ushers carry him in, and they just laid him on the floor in the front, and he sovereignly, under the glory of God, began to go through deliverance, and demons were cast out of him, got filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in tongues. <laughs> How many of you want that? I want that. I'm believing for that. And we've, seen, we've seen measures of that, but we're believing for the habitation of it, aren't we? But during that time, God began to speak to me about how to birth the impossible. Every single one of you have been given a dream. Every, even if you've not laid hold of it yet, even if you don't really know what your calling is, every single one of you are called to do something. God's called you to do something. And if you have a calling, and it's tr truly from God, and every single one of you do, I mean, even at, at just being... Non, totally non-specific. Every single believer is called to move in miracle signs and wonders. Every single believer is called to cast out demons. Every single believer is called to be an agent of the impossible. Amen. Of what would be considered in the natural realm absolutely impossible. And tonight I want to speak a little bit about what I call the inside out kingdom. I want to call this the inside out kingdom. Because in these visitations of God's glory as he was coming, he began to teach me so much about the mechanics of the glory and how the dimensions of the kingdom work and how he works and co-labors with us to birth the realm of heaven into the earthly sphere. So I want to just begin to lay a little bit of foundation for you about the inside-out kingdom. The first thing that you need to realize is that everything God has created, he created out of nothing. Okay, everything he's created, he created out of nothing. He wanted there to be light. He said, let there be light. He wanted, you know, he, he wanted that he created the earth that way. It says that the earth is literally held together by the, by his word. I mean, he created the angels. He created heaven. He didn't have any substance to work with except for his own substance. He took from his own substance from his voice, from his word, and he spoke something, and it came into existence. By his very nature, our God, our God, our uncreated God, that's never had a beginning, by his very nature, he does impossible things. Now, the Bible says that we're created in his image. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are created to look like God, it means we're created to be like God. If you're created in the image of God, and you, have, or you are a new creation, new creature, you have God living in you right now, you're created in His image, you also have the same creative power in you right now that God used to create the universe. And that's one thing you need to understand. The same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the same creative spirit that gave life to his dead body, the same creative spirit that was hovering over the deep 
over the void and the darkness when God spoke. Every time God created, every time God did anything, there was that presence of the Holy Spirit. He was hovering over the waters and then he hovered over Mary. Mary said, let it be unto me as you say. And conception took place within her. Where the Holy Spirit is, the realm of the impossible is there. And God would speak from that atmosphere of the overshadowing presence of God. He would speak from that glory. And he would create things that did not exist a moment before. Are you with me? Every single one of you are called to do the same. Adam, in the way he was created, Adam was created to live from the inside out not the outside in. I want you to really key into some of the things I'm saying tonight because it may not sound like I'm giving you a lot of keys on warfare, but I am giving you keys tonight on how to break so much of the warfare that comes against you in your life. Because many believers are trying to impact and, and change their life by putting their hands to, the, to things around them. They hear God release a word to them or give them a dream or give them a vision or maybe they're given a prophetic word that's from God but they immediately began to do things in their life by their own power to try and make things happen and how many of you know that doesn't work too well it just doesn't work too well that's the way of the world in the world system if you want to do something if you want to be great then you put your hands to everything around you but in the in the way of the kingdom but when Moses was asking to know the ways of God, there is a different way of birthing things. There is a different way of creating things. And that is the inside out kingdom. Okay, I'm just giving you a little bit of foundation. Now, the kicker to this, the, the hinge pin to this, is that it requires absolute, raw, radical faith to link into it. Because you're called to birth something that right now is not in the seen realm. If you're called to move in miracles, if you're called to open blind eyes, you're called to heal the deaf, whatever your calling is, if you have a calling from God and you can, and you can fulfill it on your own, then, it's not, then you've missed something. God will never give you a calling that you can fulfill on your own. He just won't do that because it requires dependence on him. Are you with me? Jesus was one who lived from the inside out. Jesus was not one who was impacted by the atmospheres around him. When there was a storm, Jesus would speak to the storm. And uh, he would speak peace and peace would come. Why? Because he was living in peace. So much of why believers are not living in victory around them is because they're not living in victory on the inside. Your reality inside of you, in your soul realm and in the spirit realm where, where the seed of the kingdom lies within you, that is the reality that God wants you to release from you. Are you with me? Jesus operated like that. You could say that Jesus carried his own weather system. It didn't matter what the weather was like around. It didn't matter what the natural elements looked like. It didn't matter what the sicknesses looked like. When Jesus came on the scene, he carried his own weather system with him. He carried his own atmosphere with him. He shifted atmospheres. He spoke to the storm and he, he caused peace to come because he was living in peace. He spoke to the fig tree and he cursed the fig tree. That's creative power. It's the inside out kingdom. Faith is the only link to it. I'm just, as a foundation, before we get into some of the mechanics of it, I want to say this. Raw, radical faith. There's no way around this. You have to be able to decide that you're going to believe more in what you don't see because you know it's God's perspective than you believe in what you do see. Jesus synchronized heaven and earth because he postured himself in a way in his life where he could see into the invisible realm, what the Father was wanting to say and what the Father was wanting to do. And when he could see from the Father's perspective, he could release that unseen reality into the seen realm. 
Are you with me? The Bible says in John 5, verse 19, Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father doing. I only say what I hear my Father saying. He was synchronizing heaven and earth. Um, Paul, I'll just give you the scripture. I don't want to take the time to turn there, but you write it down. Just so you guys know that I'm using scripture. I'll give you a scripture here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 through 18. The Apostle Paul, he said, do not look at the things which are seen, but look at the things that are not seen, because the things that are seen are transient. He said they're like a vapor. They're here one day, they're gone the next. What Paul was doing here was he was speaking to the believers and he was telling them a different way of living. He was telling them how to birth the impossible and the, and the, 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 the heavenly will of God in their earthly sphere. He said, don't look at the things that are around you. Look at the unseen. For what you see around you right now is transient. It's like a vapor. But what is unseen is eternal. It's unchanging. Are you with me? This is the way Jesus lived as well. Jesus lived in the earth, but he wasn't of it. And we say that, you know, as a, as a nice cute phrase, but he lived it. Jesus stood before Nicodemus. Nicodemus was the teacher of the day. I mean, he was the scholar of the day. And Jesus was talking to him and he was telling Nicodemus how to be born again, about the born again experience. And Nicodemus is saying, you know, I, I don't get it. Are you saying I have to go back into my mother's womb a second time? This is in John chapter 3. It says, you, you, you say not to go back into my mother's womb and be born a second time. And paraphrasing here now, Jesus basically says, Nicodemus... If I'm trying to share a heavenly truth with you and I'm using an earthly analogy that you understand, like birthing, but yet you still don't understand what I'm saying, then how will I ever share heavenly truths with you that have no earthly analogy? Things from the heavenly realm that you don't even have something to compare it to in the earthly realm. And then he goes on to say this. It's a profound statement. He says, no one can ascend to heaven or no one can be in heaven but he who has first come from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. So here's, let me say this again. Here's Jesus standing in front of Nicodemus. He says, no one can ascend to heaven or no one can be in heaven, but he who has first come from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. Now he's the son of man standing in front of Nicodemus in the flesh saying to Nicodemus, I'm standing in front of you, but I'm also in heaven. But I'm in heaven right now, Dick and Devis, because I came from there. If you're a born-again believer, you were born from above as well. Isn't that what the Bible says? You were born from above. You want to learn to birth the impossible, you've got to learn to see from God's perspective. There's two different kinds of, of believers. You know, let's take the story of Elisha and Gehazi, for example. Elisha and his servant. The Syrian army, the Syrian king, is furious because every time he goes out to battle, the other army knows what he's going to do. So he says, how can, this, how can this be? How do they know what we're going to do? And his men say to him, they say, well, there's this prophet that hears what you say to yourself in your bedroom. He's listening to you in your bedroom at night. As you think to yourself and discuss with yourself the battle plans. And he says, where is this prophet? We're going to kill him. So they go out and he takes, you know, thousands of horses and chariots, it says. So you, so you have thousands of horses and chariots. Who knows how many foot soldiers? Just for one guy. And they circle around his tent. Gehazi, his servant, walks out in the morning. And he's one kind of believer. And he looks with only his natural senses. He believes in God, but he's only looking at what he sees with his natural eyes. What he's seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, tasting with his natural senses. And basically he says, alas, my master, what shall we do? You know, he's, he's, he's saying, Elisha, we're, we're done. We're dead. I mean, look at this. This is impossible. This is an impossible situation. Elisha walks out with a completely different perspective. He walked out looking with eyes of the Spirit, and he saw what God saw. He tapped into how God saw the situation. Gehazi was not able to get victory in the situation because he was looking with the wrong eyes. You cannot birth the impossible. You cannot move in the dimensions of the kingdom when you're not living in the dimension of the kingdom. You've got to learn to live in it 
and see from God's perspective and hear from God's perspective. So Elisha walks out and he says, oh, don't worry. He says, there are more that are with us than are with them. And he goes and he lays his hand on his servant. He says, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he might see. And Gehazi's spiritual eyes were opened. And as you know in the story, he looks and there were thousands of horses of fire. You know, you, you thought there were just angels in heaven. Just the typical angel, right? But evidently there's creatures that look like horses that are made of fire. Pretty cool. And God released a lot of them. A lot, a lot. And they were between Elisha and the opposing army. Now, Elisha, his faith is completely lifted to a new level because he sees from God's perspective. And he has the faith then to release a decree. God, strike this entire army with blindness. And God does it. God was ready to do the same thing through Gehazi. But Gehazi wasn't looking with the right eyes. We're talking about birthing the impossible and that faith, raw radical faith, is the connector of heaven and earth. Jesus had just raised the man from the dead and the woman came to him and was absolutely blown away. And Jesus makes this statement. He says, woman, did I not tell you if you would only believe, you would see the very glory of God. But that believing requires us to go radically beyond our everyday living. So God not only resides within you, but he has mingled with your spirit, given you a brand new nature at the moment of your salvation. Now listen to this. Within your spiritual DNA that resides within you is your entire destiny and your entire future. Track with me here. When you take the seed of an oak tree, okay, within that seed of the oak tree is the entire oak tree. The full potential of that oak tree is in that seed. What that seed needs is to be planted in the proper environment. It needs to receive the sunlight, the water, all of those things. It needs the proper environment established around it. And that's all it needs. And what will come forth from that little seed is this massive oak tree that will provide shade and sustenance for many. And for the animals and everything. In the same way, when you are born again, the Bible says we have eternity in our DNA. I'll get into this a little bit more in just a moment. But for now, I just want to hit on this because I'm going to begin to unfold it. In your spiritual DNA is your entire destiny and your entire future. Your present, your present circumstances, your present life exists right now on the outside of you. But your future also already exists right now, but on the inside of you. God is looking for people that will begin to taste the powers of the age to come begin to live in the reality of who he says they will be years from now and begin to create an atmosphere from within them, create an atmosphere around them that becomes conducive to the birthing of their future. Let me unpack this a little bit. That means that every prophetic promise from God over your life already resides within you and is waiting to be birthed. But this is why our enemy Satan will do everything he can to wreak havoc in your surroundings. Because he knows that if he can distract you with the chaos around you and cause you to come into agreement with that chaos, then he has successfully distracted you from finding your destiny within and aligning yourself with it. But this also applies to the inside. When you as a person are not healed up on the inside then you're not going to be able to successfully tap into the fullness of the potential of God within you and birth it around you. Amen? This is where faith comes into play. It seems that reality to us is the very things that are impacting our natural environment, but we are not to live according to that reality. This is the radical statement that Paul is saying. He's saying, I see what's around you. He's saying, I see what's around me. 
But what Paul is saying is, you as a believer are now a citizen of heaven. Your primary citizenship is no longer of the earth. And your primary reality is no longer what's going on around you in your present circumstances. Paul is saying you now as a believer have to put your faith on things that you don't even see right now. As sons and daughters of God, we are called to bring the reality of heaven to this earth. And within you is an incubator of the spirit. And from that place comes all the fulfillment of your destiny. But there's a journey in that. Let me just take a little rabbit trail just for a moment. The interesting thing is that when God prophesies something to you and God gives you a vision and God gives you a dream or God wants you to have to move in miracles and those kinds of things, he will always prophesy something to you that's impossible for you to do on your own. And it really is one of those things where if you were here this morning, you heard me say that the Christian life really is you sign your name at the bottom of a blank contract. And as time goes on, God decides to fill it in. And you're already signed to it. God will give you a word. He'll give you a destiny. But he'll give it to you in a time in your life when you are nowhere near the person you need to be to fulfill that word. He'll give you a word and get you all excited. This is who I'm called to be. But you're nowhere near the point where you have the capacity to actually do it. But the word is an impetus. It's, it's, it's something that initiates you into a season of transforming the vessel. So he puts a seed into you. okay, And within that seed is the fullness of your future. The fullness of your destiny. But he has to begin, he does a couple of things. Number one, he begins to then, as the seed is in you, he begins to work on you as the vessel so that you begin to live your life as the vessel in such a way that carries that seed where it's conducive for growth. Am I, am I saying that clearly enough? You know, he gives this word to Joseph. And uh, Joseph was a bit cocky about it, a bit prideful about it. He tells his brothers, you're all going to bow down and worship me. And, you know, you're going to be, I see you bowing down at my feet. And uh, they didn't take that too well. You know, but I, I bet nobody here has gotten a prophetic word and gone and said, hey, God said this about me. But yet, you know, everyone around you knows who you are now. And so... Maybe they aren't as excited as you were at the moment because they're looking at you and they're thinking, really? That's what Joseph's brothers thought. Really? I mean, really? You really think we're going to bow down to you? They're like, yeah, right. I mean, he gets a word from God. The next thing he knows, he's in a pit. Then... He, someone pulls him out. He thinks, praise God, they're here to save me. Now he's a slave. But you know what Joseph learned was he had a seed of destiny within him. He knew what God was calling him to be, but he had to learn how to be a good steward of the now. Do you know how many people are just, they get a prophetic, because people think a prophetic word is something sovereign. Well, I got this word, so I'm just going to go about my life, and one day it's just going to happen. But a prophetic word is nothing but potential. Understand, there are lots of prophetic words that God has given people that were really his will for them, but they never fulfilled it. When God gives you a prophetic word, it's simply potential. It's God saying, this is what I have available for you. But it's not going to sovereignly happen. We have to co-labor with him, and we have to embrace the process of transformation to become the vessel that can carry the fulfillment of that word. And that requires having an eye on the future and believing who God has called you to be, but also being a good steward of the now. And that's what I want to help you with today, being a good steward of the now. Joseph was a good steward of the now. He had a vision, he had a dream, but he was faithful with the little. He thought, well, I'm a slave, 
But, you know, God's given me this gift of excellence. He's given me a gift of administration. He's given me a gift of interpreting dreams. And so I'm going to use those at any little teeny opportunity that I get. And one day, before you know it, Joseph has become the vessel he needs to be to fulfill the word. You know, they used to plant these, um, these trees in what you'd call biospheres. It was inside like a dome building. And um, the trees would only grow to a certain height, and then they would fall over. They would literally just fall over. And uh, the professionals, I don't know what you'd call them, that were studying the trees, they began to ask themselves the question, why are the trees growing to a certain height and then just falling over? And what they began to realize is that for some reason, the root systems of the trees were growing to a certain point and then they would stop growing. And, and it, what they also realized is that the higher the tree grows, the stronger the root system has to be. So if you're one that God's given me a big calling, watch out. Because that means you better have a really deep root system. And God has a special way of helping you with that. Because I want to tell you something. There is a move of God going on right now. See, we like to say that the move of God and the revival and the outpouring, that the move of God is just, you know, the Holy Ghost goosebumps and the miracles and the crowds coming from around the world and all of that stuff. But there's more to the move of God than just that. The higher you grow in the glory, the deeper you have to grow in the roots. So the move of God is, is growing us this way. The higher you build a building, the stronger the foundation has to be. You can have something in your life that's just a little hairline crack in your foundation, but the stronger and more weighty the glory gets on your life, it can cause what's just a little hairline fracture to suddenly be a huge mess. Are you with me? The same anointing and the same glory that can be the greatest blessing that, your that you've ever had on your life can also be the greatest test you'll ever have. The anointing, the glory of God, and moving in your destiny and stepping into your dreams is also the biggest test you'll ever walk. Are you with me? I'm, I'm just checking on you. So how many of you have gotten a word and uh, you are all excited because, you know, we like that moment when, when, when God overshadows us and there's that moment of conception and we receive a seed of the kingdom and God deposits something in us. And then we want to fast forward to the fulfillment. But we don't so much like the pregnancy stage. Yeah. Where the hormones get out of whack and, you know, you can't sleep and it's just like God just, I mean, it's like, how many of you, God has spoken something great to you. You've had a great moment in a conference where you said, Yes, God, I want your fire. I want your fire, God. I want your glory. Or you had like an Isaiah 6 moment where the coal of fire touched your life and God said, Whom will I send? And you say, Me, God, me. I'll go, I'll go. And you had this wonderful encounter and you leave the conference and all of a sudden all hell starts breaking loose in your life. Sure, the enemy is trying to do everything he can to stop you from stepping into your destiny. But God also has a personal womb, I call it, of transformation for you. And he will develop the vessel. But the key is do not stop dreaming with God. You want to birth the impossible? Dream with God. It's in the secret place of dreaming with God where God begins to reveal your destiny to you and your future begins to come forth and be nurtured. It's oftentimes right in the midst of very turbulent times in your life that God wants you to dig deep, anchor yourself in faith, looking at the unseen and not the seen. If you can tap into the unseen and live from that reality, then you can release that heavenly reality into your environment around you and prepare the way for the birthing of your future. Turn with me to Romans chapter 4 real quick. Romans chapter 4. 
don't want anybody to say I didn't turn to any scriptures. Romans chapter 4, verse 13. I'm going to skip around a little bit here, but we'll start in Romans 4, 13. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now, you want to talk about a big vision? You want to talk about a big dream? You want to talk about a big prophetic word? God comes to Abraham and says, hey, Abraham, you're going to be the father of entire nations. You're going to be the heir of the world. Now it goes on, verse 16. That is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Not only to the inheritor of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Here's what I want to get to. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He had already made Abraham the father of many nations, yet there was no fruit to show for it. He said, I have made you the father of many nations, yet he had no fruit whatsoever to show for it. It goes on to say, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Now, there's many attributes of God, but this is the one it says Abraham locked onto. There's many attributes of God you can lock onto. But it says the God he believed in was the God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. He's told he's supposed to have so many children that he's going to be the father of nations, yet he's so old he can't bring forth a child. You think God could have picked someone else to give that word to? Maybe someone a little bit younger? But no, he delivered it to Abraham because it was impossible. But it says he did not weaken in his faith. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Now that's a problem too. By the way, his wife's barren. Cannot conceive. But no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. One of the keys to birthing the impossible is begin to live in the future now. How do you do that? When God begins to speak to you, you say, well, Ryan, I've got all this going on in my life. How do I anchor myself in the unseen? Take that prophetic promise, take that prophetic dream, and meditate on it, think about it, and in your mind's eye, begin to live in it right now in the moment, even though it's not your reality in your present. I remember... When I was a, um, a young teenager, you know, I was, um, I was a, believe it or not, I was a punk rocker. I had a purple mohawk that stood a foot off my head. I had black leather jacket with spikes and patches and combat boots. And, you know, I was a skateboarder. You know, you, just, you, know, you get into school, you end up fitting in with a crowd, and that's the crowd I fit in with, and the mosh pits, and, you know, all that kind of thing. And uh, I got saved at the age of 11 in a Methodist youth group. And um, they were able to get me saved, but not any further as far as experiencing the reality of God. And I'm an extreme person. I mean, I don't want the plastic Jesus. I want the real living Jesus. I want everything he says I can have. So I became very lukewarm. And just real quickly, I, I, uh, we went on a backpacking trip. I was about 15 years old. And um, I, we were in the Bighorn Mountains of Colorado I, in Wyoming. I got separated from the group. And uh, completely lost, even though I grew up in the mountains. I knew how not to get lost. But um, 
I knew it, I don't I knew now I didn't at the time it was it was a total God hijacking I mean I turned around and I swear to this day God changed the whole landscape because I knew how not to get lost I turned around everything was different I had no idea where I was there was none of the landmarks that I had looked for were there anymore everything was different I was lost I was out there all night long and uh, they searched for me all night. They couldn't find me. They went down to get search and rescue. Search and rescue said, we'll come and get his body tomorrow. They said, there's a snowstorm coming at the elevation that you're at. There's no way he'll make it. There's no way we're putting our men in, in danger. They said, we're, we're, we're so sorry. And uh, at the same time, I'm crying out to God. I, I had fallen in the river and uh, begun to go into early stages of hypothermia and uh, God, God has a way of getting you into situations where you'll say things and commit to things that you wouldn't normally do in a sane frame of mind. And so I am, I am cold. I mean, I am, I am freezing cold. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in and out of consciousness. And at one point, I remember saying, fine, God, because I was angry. I was angry at this point. I said, fine, God, if you'll save me, I'll give my life to you in full-time ministry. But I didn't, that's not really what I'd planned on saying. It wasn't what I meant to say. But I heard God audibly for the first time ever in my life. I heard him audibly. It's happened a couple times since then. But I heard the audible voice of God in the mountains. You think he would have said something profound. But all I heard him say was, okay. <laughs> Thundering through the mountains. And supernaturally, the group found me. I mean, um, Come to find out that we were, we were I, w I ended up being a whole, on the o whole other side of the mountain. And uh, we don't know how it happened. But within 10 minutes, they were where I was, or I was where they were. Somebody was transported. We don't know. I mean, it was just a little Methodist youth group. We didn't even know about that kind of stuff. And we still can't, can't explain it. But they found me within a couple hours, two, three hours, there was a, over a foot of snow on the ground. And uh, I, was, I was saved. But at that time... God began to give me a vision for ministry, but I had no connections. I had, I, had, I had no ministry, none of this. But I remember I would lay in bed at night, and I would just dream. Nothing around me told me it was ever going to happen. Nothing in my circumstances leaned itself to traveling the nations of the world. I mean, I'm in South Dakota. If you've ever been to South Dakota, you know what I'm saying. But I would put posters on the wall of crowds of people. And I would envision myself preaching on the kingdom. I would envision myself moving in miracles. And what I began to find was, is when I put myself, when I chose to pull my senses away from what was reality in the natural and, and anchor myself into the invisible realm, people say, well, Ryan, you're crazy. Yeah, I am. I mean, I... I live in that, you know, that place beyond the rainbow, you know, that sweet by and by over the rainbow. That's where I live. And uh, God has done amazing things in my life because of it. Because I'd enter into that place in the spirit and I'd find that God would begin to take me. And I'd begin to dream with God and I'd be in different places throughout the nations. I'd fall asleep. I'd dream about it. I'd wake up in the morning thinking about it. What I realize now is that God was teaching me how to prepare my present for the birthing of my future. I was incubating a seed of destiny within me by choosing to focus on the truth of that rather than what was around me. Because when I focused on the seed, it began to grow in my life and an accelerated growth in the glory began to take place. Are you with me? I've, I've oftentimes been in different places around the world. I was in recently in Seoul, South Korea. And um, ministering to about 6,000 Koreans. And there's nothing like the sound of when the glory of God comes and touches 6,000 Koreans. I remember standing there thinking, God, never let me forget the sound that I'm hearing right now. As your glory is touching all at one time 6,000 Koreans that are under the glory of God. I said, God, never let me forget the sound. And I'm standing there on the platform totally lost control of the meeting because God's running the meeting now and I'm just standing there as the glory of God's touching all these Koreans and God takes me back to a moment when I was laying in my bed as a teenager dreaming with God and I realized I've been here before. Yes. 
everything about it. I stood there as one of the most surreal moments of my life as I looked around and realized I lived this moment years ago when I had nothing to show for it and I was dreaming with God. But I learned to incubate a seed and prepare my present for the birthing of my future. Now I want to read a couple things to you. Just as I had released this word, there was another prophet, God confirms his message by two or three witnesses. Listen to this. This was a word that Kim Clement actually had released a couple of months after I had started preaching this. It was so confirming. It says this. The future is now inside of you. The present is now outside of you. The future wants to become the present. However, in many instances... Our present is so full of unbelief, fear, anger, resentment, lack of anticipation that the future does not feel welcome. I know this sounds crazy, but if you think about the future being inside of you, wanting to become the present and wanting to be born, then you will realize that you and I actually control what happens to a promise from God. A promise from God is the future waiting to be born. Adjust your present for your future. Is your present welcoming the future? It's time to make an adjustment to your present and clear it of all the cluttering forces of unforgiveness, resentment, fear, anger, etc., doubt, unbelief, anxiety, whatever it is, so that the future can have a place to feel welcome and appear. You have to make an adjustment in your present by taking the future your promise and your destiny, and applying it to your present by proclaiming it, commanding it, and adoring it. Treat it well, and it will treat you well. Whatever is not in line with your destiny needs to be adjusted or removed. If something is standing in your way in terms of your future, get it out of your life. He goes on to say, you have eternity in your DNA. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says that God has placed eternity in the heart of men. Eternity means past, present, and future all in one. As a living being, you have eternity in your DNA, which is your information structure. It is not only your genetic information, but also your spiritual destination. Already exists within you. Now, I want to close. I want to share two more, or just two principles with you on how to begin to create an atmosphere around you that's conducive to the birthing of your future. Now, the interesting thing is, you know, God has put laws, spiritual laws into place that Christians can live according to and non-Christians, unbelievers can live according to. In the same way that there are natural laws in place. For example, gravity. Gravity doesn't care if you're a king and you're a wealthy dignitary or you're someone who has nothing. Gravity doesn't care. If you step off a building, you're going to fall. In the same way, there are spiritual laws that God has put into place. And the crazy thing is, is that there are new agers operating by soul power. You know, the, as you heard me say this morning, anybody can operate in the spirit realm. It's a question of source. Who's your source? Jesus said, if anybody enters in but by me, the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the door. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If anybody enters in besides through me, they're a thief and a robber. He didn't say they couldn't enter into the things of the Spirit or the dimension of the Spirit. They're just not entering into the kingdom. They're accessing things in an illegal way that God never intended for them to do. But there are New Agers that are writing books on things like Ask and It Shall Be Given. And they're writing principles. They're, they're locking into spiritual principles that are in the Bible, in the Word of God. And they're getting more miraculous results than many believers. And so some of the things I'm going to share, I don't want you to freak out because maybe you've heard of them in the New Age realm. But you need, like I said earlier, the devil's never created anything. The devil is a created being. So he counterfeits only those things that are valuable. No one ever counterfeits a penny. People counterfeit something that's valuable. And so Satan is counterfeiting the supernatural power of God in order to fascinate the world to worship him. But these are biblical Christian principles. The first one I want to talk about is how to attract 
the realm of the spirit around you, either the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. And the New Agers would call this law of attraction. I'm going to give you some scriptures. This is all through the Bible. Jesus taught on it. Let me give you this as a testimony. I had a friend uh, one time, a prophet that's um, in New Zealand, I think now. No, I'm sorry, Australia. And there was a four-month period of time where God opened up his spiritual senses 24 hours a day with no effort of just kind of trying to abide in the vine, you know, that kind of thing. It's just 24 hours a day, seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, tasting in the realm of the Spirit, just open. And he said it, it was amazing. He, he said it was, it was profound, and it was almost, you know, blew out his senses sensory-wise. He said he was amazed to see the battle that's going on moment by moment around unbelievers, but also believers. He was amazed to see how active it is in the spirit realm between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness every single day and all night while you sleep. There is a battle that is going on and the battle is over which kingdom is going to influence you. Because if you are more influenced by the reality of the supernatural kingdom of God on a daily basis, then you're going to be making an impact for the kingdom. You can be a believer and be more influenced by the kingdom of darkness every day than you are the kingdom of light. That's a reality. There are so many believers that are operating and living as victims rather than victors. And here's what he saw. He saw that thoughts, now you've got to understand in, in the spirit realm, thoughts are a stronger uh, form of communication than even speaking words. But what he saw was a thought released a color, he saw it as a color a fragrance and a frequency. Now, scientists have even proven that thoughts release a frequency and the, the power that mind has even over your body. They hooked up the, all the, the computer stuff to Olympic runners. And they said to the runners, we want you to run the race in your mind. Just in your mind, sitting in the chair, we want you to run the race. And as they imagined it in their mind, what they saw was that all the muscles that they would have used in the race were actually, literally, physically firing in their body just because they were imagining it. So the power of your thought life is having an impact and causing ripple effects around you. So when you think something, it releases, he saw in the spirit, it releases a color, a fragrance, and a frequency. When you add an emotion to your thought, it amplifies it even more. It's like just putting emotion, you know, everything starts with a thought, and then you get an emotion about that thought, and it just amplifies it out even more. And he said all of this was like, for the kingdom of darkness, was like blood in the water for sharks. If, if there were things going on, your, on in your life that were causing you to be depressed, and you focused on that, then you were emitting a frequency of depression. And sharks can smell, I heard sharks can smell one drop of blood in the water from nearly a mile away. It's, it's amazing. And when you are emitting depression, anxiety, fear, doubt, worry, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, whatever it is, and oftentimes it's the little things, whatever it is, if you're thinking about those things, then you are releasing things out into the atmosphere that are literally drawing the kingdom of darkness around you because they smell it, they sense it, they see it. Now here's the reality of the kingdom. You don't change your atmosphere around you by putting your hands to it. You don't live from the outside in. The way the spirit world works, the way the kingdom works, is living from the inside out. So what you release from you empowers an atmosphere around you. It works opposite than the way it works in the world. What you release from you empowers the atmosphere around you. This is why Paul said, no matter what is going on around you, no matter how negative it is, no matter how depressing it is, lock into faith and set your eyes on God's perspective of your situation. By raw radical faith. And as you focus on that, you'll draw the kingdom of light around you. It's one thing to have God living within you. But it's another thing to, have, to establish an atmosphere around you. Many people don't realize this. 
So every day when they wake up, the devil starts coming against you at the first part of your day. You stub your toe, you get angry, whatever. You get in an argument with your spouse, something happens. If you don't gain victory in that first hour or two of your day, and you don't dedicate that day to the Lord and choose right at that moment what you're going to emit from yourself, no matter what your circumstances look like, then you're not preparing your present for the birthing of the kingdom. What you're doing is you're attracting the kingdom of darkness to establish an atmosphere that you will carry with you the rest of the day until you break through it. You are the one, you individually, you are the one that decides whether you live under an open heaven or a closed heaven. You are the one that decides what atmosphere you carry with you. When you walk into a room of a bunch of depressed people, you should come in and change the atmosphere. You shouldn't line up and become depressed. In the same way, this works with the kingdom of light. The Bible says whatever's praiseworthy, whatever's honorable, focus on those things. Set your mind on those things. Why? Because you're emitting something that the Holy Spirit loves. That the kingdom of light loves. I can begin to focus my mind. I can, I can if I want to get in the presence of the Lord, and just, I know I'm already there, but I just need to lock in in my mind. I can just lock into the reality that I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places right now. No matter what's going on around me, I lock into that reality. And I literally can begin to feel the atmosphere shift around me right there in the room. I can feel literally as it is in heaven in the room. It should not be uncommon for us to experience angels around us. They want to be around you. They're assigned to you. The problem is most of your angels are bored. Because if you're not keyed in to what God wants to do in your life and you're not releasing those decrees and aligning yourself with him... The angels will operate according to the God's word, God's decree released through you. Are you with me? Abraham did this. When God called Abraham, he called Abraham out. And he said, Abraham, look at the stars. Do you see the stars, Abraham? You see how many they are? I want to go ahead and have somebody come up on the keyboard, if you would. We're going to begin in just a moment to transition. I just want to have someone play. He said, Abraham, look at the stars. He said, Abraham, look at the grains of sand. Look at how many there are. He said, so shall your descendants be. I can imagine then Abraham went through life and nothing was happening. And he would go out at night and look at the stars. God gave Abraham something that he could lock onto that would cause him to anchor himself in a promise from God. Are you hearing me? You want to birth the impossible? You've got to anchor yourself in the impossible. I can imagine when Abraham just had a few kids. He had his kids, then he had a grandson. He had Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I can imagine Isaac walking out and seeing Abraham looking at the stars and saying, Dad, what are you doing? And I can imagine Abraham saying, Son, God told me one day to look at the stars. God told me one day to look at the sand. And he told me, he gave me this as a visual because he said, one day this will be how, how numerable your descendants are. I believe Isaac learned how to do it. I believe Jacob learned how to do it. I know Jacob learned how to do it because there was a moment when Jacob in his life was serving Laban. Maybe some of you remember the story. It's in Genesis chapter 30. You can turn there later. That's good. Just, you can just go ahead and play in the background. That's good. I want to begin, I want you to begin to tune in to the Spirit because God's going to begin to awaken some things even in you tonight. But Jacob was serving Laban, and there was a time when he went to Laban and he said, Laban, it's time for you to let me go. And Laban said, Okay, I'll let you go. You take all the spotted and speckled calves and go on your way. But before Jacob could get to them, what did Laban do? Laban went to all the spotted and speckled calves and he took them away so that Jacob had no herds. So Jacob grows up watching his father who watched his father learn how to birth the impossible. He learned the principle that what you focus on 
and what you meditate on, what you posture yourselves before as your primary focus is what you'll birth, is what you'll release in your life. So Jacob goes to the trees and he tears the bark off the trees and he paints spots and speckles on the bark. Then he waits until the strongest of the herds come to the watering trough because it's at the watering trough that they would mate. Now mating is intimacy. And he would set out the bark with the spots and speckles on them so that the herds would see the bark when they're mating. And what they saw in their place of intimacy is what they brought forth. God wants to open up your spiritual eyes tonight. God wants to open up your spiritual senses tonight. And he wants to give you a vision of something greater. He wants to give you a vision of something impossible. He wants to give you that intimate encounter in his presence. And in that moment, he wants to show you something. He wants to show you a promise. And many of you have seen it already. But you've got to begin to lock onto it. And Jacob set those out there. And they made it and they brought forth more spotted and speckled calves that were ever there before. And he left with more herds than Laban had. The last one is this, the law of observation. How you observe yourself and how you observe a situation is how it will line up to be in your life. Scientists took one electron and they began to look at it and it was spinning one way. Then another scientist would come and look at it and it was spinning another way. And it would go on and on and on. It would keep spinning different ways. And they began to ask themselves the question, why does the electron spin a different way when each different person looks at it? And they began to realize that the electron matter itself was adapting itself to spin in the way that the scientists thought it would spin. The earth itself, nature itself, and your circumstances around you, you were created to influence those things by releasing the decree and the word of God from the invisible realm, from the seed that God has planted within you. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Here's the problem. So many people in the body of Christ have been given a vision. So many people have been given a dream. But they don't see themselves the way God sees themselves. They see themselves in their own eyes. And it's not a pretty picture. And so instead of line, aligning yourself with how God sees you. People are aligning themselves with how they see themselves. With a low self-esteem. With the idea that I can never measure up. I can never do this. And so the impossibilities that God is causing you to do, you're not stepping into because of how you observe who you are in your situation. And I've learned something about the glory. You know, I'm always mentoring a handful of people. And um, God spoke to me one time and he said, Ryan, when you take on new interns, he said, I want you to begin to see them the way I see them. And I want you to get an image of them in what they'll be operating in 10 years from now. I want you to get a vision of them and what they'll be operating in 20 years from now. And Ryan, he said, when they are around you, I want you to begin to look at them like they are who they will be. And I want you to begin to release an atmosphere around you of expectancy that causes them to rise up into who they're supposed to be. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, Ryan, how you observe them is how they will be when they're around you. And so I began to put it to the test. And I got to tell you, it was the most amazing thing. It caused, it literally caused an explosion 
in their relationship with God, an explosion in the glory of God, an explosion in their giftings. Literally, it started a process in place where the acceleration of the growth in God immediately started. And they grew in months what might have taken years. Why? Because I looked at their prophetic potential and I called them higher. I want you to stand with me tonight if you would. Has this helped some of you? I know it's getting late, but hey, this is a conference. That's what we do. We're going to begin to pray for lots of people here in a moment. We're going to begin to pray for the sick. But the first thing I want to do, the first thing the Lord spoke to me tonight, is there are some of you here that you have a dream. There's some of you here you have a vision. There's some of you here you know you have a destiny. But there is a spirit of self-hatred that has been coming against you. We got all sorts of emails coming in over the webcast this morning when I mentioned it. It's amazing to me how God is wanting to raise up an army to impact the world, but yet so many don't yet even believe in themselves. You might say tonight, well, Ryan, I don't hate myself. Well, it doesn't come as strong like that. It sneaks in where day after day, you're just kind of hard on yourself. You beat yourself up. You don't really believe in yourself. God asks you to do something and you think, oh, well, they could do it better than me. Who am I to do that? Or you have this performance mentality like, I, did, I haven't prayed enough or I haven't done this well enough or I haven't done that well enough. And I'm telling you, it's a spirit of self-hatred that the enemy has been trying to release to hinder you from believing who you are in God. When you don't believe in yourself, it's the same as not believing in the God who lives in you. And so tonight, before we pray for the sick who, who need physical healing in their bodies, I want to pray for those who need inner healing in their souls. Those of you here, I want you to be brave. I want you to be bold. Those of you here that say, Ryan, that's me. That's me. I have a low self-esteem. It comes against me. It's been preventing me from stepping into my calling. It's been preventing me from stepping forward, stepping, uh, stepping out and taking risks for the kingdom, stepping out in the anointing. If that's you, I want you to come on up. Come on, be bold today. If that's you, you need to have this broken off of your life tonight. And God's going to come. He's going to break that off of you. And He's going to restore a passion. He's going to restore a purpose. He's going to restore a destiny. He's going to restore that vision. Look at this. Let's have the band go ahead and come on up. I want to pray for you. This is almost like praying for everyone. Just begin to welcome the Holy Spirit to come. He's already here. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, with that great breaker anointing. Come, Holy Spirit, with that bondage breaking anointing right now. Come, Holy Spirit, and break the chains. Come, Holy Spirit, and break the shackles. Come, Holy Spirit, and break the power of that spirit. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over that spirit of self-hatred. Right now, in the name of Jesus, every demonic spirit that comes against you, that tries to prevent you from knowing who you are, that causes you to loathe yourself, that causes you to attack yourself, right now, in the name of Jesus, I expose that spirit. And I rebuke you right now. I take authority over you right now. And I say, loose and let them go. Loose and let them go. Loose and let them go right now in Jesus' name. Right now in Jesus' name. Now I'm going to begin to move through the crowd. I want you guys just to begin to flow in worship. And uh, you can ramp it up some if you want. Let's go after God. Believe for that breaker anointing to come. We're going to move into healing in just a moment. But I want to lay hands. It's, it's, I know there's a lot of people, but I have to be obedient to the Lord. I want to lay hands on these people. I'm going to need some catchers. And I'm going to start over here. But I want you to go after God because there's amazing freedom that's going to begin to come. Some of you are going to get your physical healing right now in this moment because you've been bound up physically because of what's been going on inside of you. And God doesn't want to just heal you physically and not get to the root. 
right now, tonight, we're going to the root of so much of what's been plaguing you. So let's begin to sing and, and worship the Lord, whatever you guys have. But I want you to focus on the Holy Spirit and begin to go after Him. Those of you that aren't up here at the altar call, just be stretch forth your hands and begin to release the anointing towards them. Amen. We break it off right now. Loose. Loose. Every demonic spirit. Loose in Jesus' name. God for releasing physical healing, miracles, signs, wonders, loose in Jesus' name. Healing virtue, bondage breaking anointing. right now. Right now it comes off. It comes off. Loose in Jesus name. Lifting, 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 lifting. Loose. 